Okay, so uh, like Bill was saying, this is the introduction to software exploits class. Um, we're not talking about web app security or anything like that. This is all kind of low level um, security buffer overflows, that kind of thing. And um, just so you're all aware, this is a very lab driven course. You'll probably be spending over half your time in this course, probably more like two thirds looking into a debugger. So hopefully you like things like that, because that's what you'll be doing for most of the class. And it's important because with a material like this, I can stand up here all day and talk about it, and if I walk out of the room, you would all forget, unless you do it yourselves. So um, hopefully by spending that much time with uh, labs, you guys will walk away and be able to reproduce um, what we did in the class on your own. Okay, so about me. I'm uh, Corey Kallenberg. I'm based out of the Colorado Springs site. I did work in McLean for about a year, but I transferred to Colorado Springs a few years ago. Um, I've been doing exploits since ninth grade maybe, something like that. Um, basically I learned how to do all this stuff by doing a lot of hacking contests and um, trying to write exploits for uh, vulnerabilities and stuff like that. Um, it's mainly something that I do for fun. I like looking for bugs and uh, secure days and all that kind of thing. I mainly do work in um, rootkit detection, kernel development, and I do do some work with uh, developing exploit mitigation technologies. Um, yeah, and I'm really bad at PowerPoint. <laughs> And most of the PowerPoint slides were created using screen, a uh, print screen, MS Paint, copy and paste, but uh, it's not, not too important because we're going to be working in console most of the time and in debugger, so we're not about big flashy graphics because um, everyone knows that console is more easy than having a nice fancy GUI. So, since I'm not based out of Bedford, I do kind of want to uh, go around and get to know some of you guys. So, the purpose of this course is to really go in depth on a few key simple topics. It's not a survey course, um, it's not a high level course. We're going to be hitting a few key concepts and getting them over and over again to really uh, ingrain them into your memory. Um, Hopefully, in the course, you'll be able to sort of understand uh, the implications of bad programming, to identify bad programming, um, to write your own exploits for some basic vulnerabilities. Um, also, understand better exploit mitigation technology. You can all these things called ASLR depth. You'll have a better feeling of why these things um, are effective sometimes, where they're not effective, uh, why they were invented, sort of the history behind that. And uh, yeah, depth, not breadth. I've already reiterated that. Um, just as a disclaimer to begin the class, so uh, people have heard about buffer overflows, and that's generally what we're talking about in the class. And some of your friends might have told you, oh, buffer overflows are extinct, or exploit mitigation technologies render uh, buffer overflows not exploitable. Both of those are completely false. Uh, buffer overflows, even your basic ones, are still present in a lot of software out there. Um, for you IDA Pro guys, just download some software that your sponsor uses and do a cross-reference on sprintf. You'll find lots of interesting things. And also, um, exploit mitigation technology uh, does not render everything not exploitable. It makes some bugs not exploitable, but a large percentage of them can still be exploited. It just requires uh, more work and more trickery. And we'll actually work on um, bypassing death, at least in this class. And then in my Exploits 2 course, I'll basically have us, in one of our labs, blow away every exploit mitigation technology that Windows XP has to offer, at least. And for that matter, on Windows 7. Okay, so this is our course outline. This is kind of what we're covering on day one. We're going to talk about basic stack overflows. Uh, you guys probably all heard of that, uh, but you'll actually be doing them, so you'll know uh, in gory detail how those work and how to implement them. Talk about developing your own shell code. We're all going to write our own shell code to do something. That's kind of fun for the guys that uh, like assembly and low level programming. So that's what that's all about is handcrafting your own assembly. Um, there's a lot of stack overflows, so we'll spend more time on that. And we're also going to talk about heaps and heap overflows. And these days, uh, heaps and heap overflows are becoming more and more important because a lot of the browser type vulnerabilities you see is sort of a related to heap corruption and use after free and stuff like that. And I'll talk a little bit more later on about um, about you know use after creating these other exploitation scenarios involving the heap. But let's not concern ourselves with that right now. It's uh, a little bit crazy. 
So day number two, um, day number one is mostly devoted to sort of um, understanding the mechanics of exploitation, learning how to write your own exploits. It's really kind of the, uh, you know, just once you've found the vulnerability, how do you exploit it? Day two spends more time on actually identifying these vulnerable scenarios that way when you're looking at source code for your own project or for a sponsor, you can recognize, okay, this is maybe bad. I should check this out a little bit further. And uh, we're also going to talk about exploit mitigation technology. Um, and see, you know, the pros and cons and weaknesses and strengths there. Okay, uh, as I've already mentioned, this is a completely lab-driven course. Um, you're going to be spending most of your time in GDB and at the console. So prepare yourselves for that. Hopefully you'll enjoy debugging because you'll be doing a lot of it. Probably 90% of exploit development involves just staring into a debugger. GDB if you're in Linux or when you if you're in Windows. <sighs> All right, so. Let's get started with the actual material now that I've gone through all the sort of prerequisite uh, information. Also, if anyone has any questions, including you remote people, please ask me right away because I know this material is pretty complicated. Um, in fact, it's really very complicated at times. And sometimes I sort of take for granted that I've been doing this for a long time and I forget that things that are sort of natural to me because I've done them a hundred times seem really strange and crazy to you guys. Also, one thing that we're going to try to do in this course that I have not done before is I want everyone to try to keep a sheet of paper or something to keep notes on, even if it's just a notepad. And every command that we use, like in the debugger, I suggest that you write that command down, like in a notepad or just on a piece of paper, and maybe jot what it does. Because I've had all my students in previous courses you know, ask for a uh, basically a cheat sheet. But if I just give you the cheat sheet, I feel like you kind of uh, won't remember it as well. So if you actually just make it yourself as we're going through the course, hopefully you'll remember these commands better and you'll be able to uh, reuse them. They all do appear in the slides pretty well for you to um, look at, like, oh, how to core do this or how to core do that. But it'll just help you out if you have them all in one place. Because I know some of the commands are pretty esoteric and you know, not very uh, intuitive. Okay, so here you go. Here's your first exploit that we're going to see in this class. Uh, this was a real exploit um, back in 1999 or whenever it was when we came out. I don't remember exactly. Um, the Matrix, this was some SSH exploit which obviously no longer works from back then. Uh, before the days of the movies, this was some kind of buffer overflow in SSH and that's what our uh, protagonist here is using. So just kind of funny that they're actually using a real exploit there uh, in the movie. Um, before we get started on trying to actually develop exploits, let's just keep in mind what our goal is. Oftentimes what we're doing is extremely complicated and we can sort of get lost in what we're trying to do. So always keep in mind, you know, what is our end goal? And in this class, our end goal is arbitrary code execution. We want to cause an application to um, do our bidding, do whatever. So for instance, you have like an HTTP server, like Apache, and you want to give it, allow it to give you arbitrary code execution. So instead of um, just serving up HTTP sessions, it instead gives you, you know, a shell or something like that, or anything else that's useful to the attacker. Instead of just parsing HTML, it's now downloading a rootkit from some website and then uh, installing it on the web server. So basically, it's turning a process from what it was intended to do and making it do whatever you want to do. Okay. This is the first program. I'm here on slide number slide number 11. Are, are you synced up? Can someone tell me that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So slide number 11. Uh, you see on the left pane there, this simple login program. This is the first thing that we're going to be exploiting. And this will sort of teach you the basics of stack overflows. So um, the first approach we take is, okay, let's take the Hollywood approach and see how that works out for us. So obviously, you know, this is what they do in the movies. They just sort of automatically have some crazy programs and you know, the password or something like that. But uh, you know, it doesn't work. What a surprise. So the way that we're actually going to exploit a program is going to look more like this. So this probably looks a little bit crazy uh, to you guys now, but I promise you by the end of the day, you will know what every byte of this payload means. Because you'll be constructing them yourselves all day. 
Okay. Before we can start exploiting, though, it is integral for software exploitation to have an in-depth knowledge of x86, our architecture, our target architecture. So out of curiosity, who in this class has taken Zeno's x86 classes? Um, so let's just review some basic x86 stuff that you're going to absolutely need to know to uh, write these exploits. Okay. So just like an ARM or something like this, an x86, you have a bunch of registers like EAX, EBX, ECX, blah, blah, blah. There's a bunch of them. You know all of them. Uh, two registers, or actually three that we really care about, are EDP, ESP, and EIP. So who in here knows what um, ESP is? Yep, Sackmore. Sackmore, right. So does the, uh, okay, Harry, I'll give you next time for one of the questions. Now, do you know in x86, does the stack pointer point at the, um, the next free entry on the stack or the last used entry on the stack? Does anyone know that? Where does ESP point to in x86? Yep, the last used. Last to use. So when you do something like a push, there's a subtraction of the stack point first and then the entry. Okay, now who knows what the EBP, EBP register is? Yep, frame pointer. And what is the purpose of that? Mark the beginning of a stack frame. Yeah, don't worry about all this. I'm going to throw this on the board a little bit. Just want to see where you guys are at. And then PIP, who knows that? That's what we're after. Yeah, pointer. Right. So when we can control the EIP, you know, that's uh, that means good for us. So whenever you see EIP equals four one four one four one four one, you should go yay. But not really because that's only half the battle. All right. So I'm going to um, sort of draw out what happens on the board uh, with the stack when we step through a program's execution because we have to know this just in gruesome detail to be able to develop exploits. And then after I sort of done it abstractly on the board, um, we'll actually step through the, the debugger and see if, you know, what actually happened in real time. And hopefully that will teach you some of the basic uh, debugger commands as well. Out of curiosity, who in here has used GDB before? OK, well, I agree. Um, and for the remote people, uh, it's OK if you have not. In fact, usually most of my students have not worked much with GDB. But um, you'll be pretty good at it on either class, at least. Do you guys use WinDebug at all, out of curiosity? Okay. WinDebug is actually pretty good. OK, so Bill, I'm going to write some stuff on the board here. So um, if we could point at the board, that would be good. All right, so. So I'm just going to draw what happens to the stack and what happens to the registers uh, during the execution of this program, this simple login program. So hopefully you guys can just uh, look at the source code and sort of figure out what's going on. So most importantly to remember is that this is kind of crazy, but in x86, and I'm not sure about ARM or whatever, but uh, in x86 the stack grows down. Okay, So whenever you need to add space to the stack, you're basically subtracting from the stack pointer. So, okay, let me find the winner here. I think I almost. And Bill, please let me know if the remote students are having a hard time seeing what I'm drawing on the board. Okay, uh, I'm going to zoom in on anyways once you get down to some detail. Yeah, I know. I'm just trying to decide, you know, not to screw myself and get myself enough board room here. Okay, so ESP is moving down more and more space space when you're in the stack. So every time, or here's another question: What is stored on the stack? Anyone in any remote users? Anyone in here? What's stored on the stack? Oh, non parameters. Parameters for our so arguments. Yeah. Local variables. Yeah. Okay. Return addresses. 
That's what we're after. Uh, Save brain pointers. So basically, all this junk that we just listed off accumulates on the stack as our program is executing. Let me notify this program myself. So, um, so we have like local var one. ESP comes down to give us more space. We just created another local var. Let's say over in our in our source code, we're doing something like integer local v. So each time this happens, basically our stack pointer is moving down. And what happens is when a, a program executes, or when a function executes rather, let's say we have a function like uh, you know f, and it's going to create uh, three integers in a b. What you would see in the debugger is instead of subtracting from the ESP each time, it would just you know do a mass subtraction at the beginning to make room for all this stuff. So um, to make room for these local variables, how much space will be subtracted in x86? Well, 12, right? Because uh, integers are 32, 32 bits in x86. So if you were to look at this function in a debugger, you would see something in the beginning like sub ESP12. So just moving the stack pointer down to, um, to accommodate the room for all these local variables. So that's kind of uh, what's happening with the stack. Now, another important register to talk about is uh, the frame pointer, EVP. And basically, when you have a function executing, um, the processor sets up EVP to point at we'll say right here. And this is our frame pointer. And a frame pointer basically just gives us a reference point um, so we can locate all of our local variables. So let's say that um, 12 bytes was subtracted here because we have 3 times uh, 4 byte integers, 4 byte values. And their space, I'll just say this is a stack, that's kind of like their 4 byte space on the stack. So we'll say, it is one 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 one. A is two 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 two. B is three 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 three. And um, EVP is pointing somewhere up here above them. And whenever the program wants to reference one of these local variables, um, what you actually see happening is, let's say it wants to move the value of enter in into a register like EAX. What you would actually see is something like move EAX. EBP minus four. So EBP is pointing here, minus four points to uh, points to here. So basically, it's just giving us this reference point that we can use to uh, reference all of our local variables. That sort of makes sense to you guys. Okay. Now, what happens is that each function has its own set of local variables. So let's say Inside the F function, you know, it's creating some local variables, integer in, but then it's also calling some other function. And then G, this function here, is using its own local variables. And so we'll say G syntax is plus doing something and it's making another integer. So what I'm trying to demonstrate here is that each function needs its own uh, reference point because uh, each function has its own stack frame on the stack, right? So after g exits, if this function wants to uh, mess with its local variables again, it has to make sure that the, uh, the this frame pointer, EVP, It's still the same. And EB, EBP has a different value for the F and N and the F and G functions because um, they each have their own sets of local variables from stack frames. You guys sort of remember all this from x86 and stuff, right? Is this all wildly confusing to any of you guys? This should most of your review. Remote guys, are you calling this okay? 
Bill, you can just sort of give me a consensus. Uh, we have uh, a yes, a yes, and a sort of, and a sure. Okay. All right. And Zeno is telling you to full screen your slides. Okay. Uh, how do I even do that? That's five. Or six, that's five, actually. Oh, no. Okay. So, um, Luther seemed a little bit confused about um, EVP and ESP and all that. And I know that my uh, description up here is a little bit vague. But uh, what's going to happen is that we're going to step through this program in the debugger and look at the values of all those registers. And hopefully doing that will make it um, a little bit clearer what's going on. So we can uh, sort of step through this. I've already kind of done on the board. Uh, what the stack will look like when this program is it executes. So in the main function, the first thing that happens is uh, the authorize function is called. So you know EIP is going to start pointing at this block of code. And um, a couple things are going to happen when you see a call like this. And in fact, let's go ahead and just um, fire for a debugger and um, so we can see this happening in real time. Okay, so everyone try to start up your virtual machine. Has everyone in Bedford done that already at least? Okay, yeah. So on your desktop you will see a, a TSD 425 exploits directory. And if you have, actually I think Mike said he fixed it already. So if you just go into the Slack call directory and double click on this VMX file, you should have the VM come up and it might ask you like, uh, you know, did you move this or copy it? Just put the default answer, I copied it. And if you up in the left corner, you should see like a, a play button to use the virtual machine. So I'll give everyone a minute to get that going. Everyone in Bedford got their VM up. Any problems? Uh, yeah, what's the login and password? Uh, login and password for the computer for the VM. For the VM. Uh, it's student and student or student and root. You should probably just use a student uh, user. Okay. Yeah. And if you want, Xlinux is actually installed solve in the virtual machines. If you want to use it, you can just type start X, but um, you, you're probably better off working in console. The only reason I have Xlinux is started up in mine is so I can make the font bigger use more easily. Yeah, you guys will have to uh, excuse me if some of um, this has to be like, you know, is a little bit slower than usual. And that's because we're videotaping this class for open security training today, which is a website that Zeno and I run. Uh, Zeno really orchestrated it to um, post all of our security training. So we try to, um, you know, filter out anything like that. So, virtual machines. Everyone running it? Good? Okay. Uh, remote users, got the VM started. Okay, so the remote guys are getting stuff still figured out a little bit, so um, while we're waiting for them, I just want to show you the slides again and sort of show you what we should expect to see. So there we go, there's a stack, program just started executing. Um, let's look at what happens when this authorized call is hit. So when authorize is called, a couple things happen to the stack. Uh, the first thing is that whenever you see like a call function in x86, um, the first thing that enters onto the stack is the return address. So whenever you see a call, it's really like push uh, next to EIP and then jump to um, you know, jump to the function address. So it's just pushing that return address onto the stack. So here we go. There's the return address. And uh, who knows where that return address will be pointing to in main? Next instruction. 
Uh, yeah, but could you tell me what the next instruction would actually be? It's just a bit of trivia. You don't actually have to do this. So it actually be pointing at um, some code to handle this conditional statement, right? Um, an x86 would probably be something like test EAX EAX to see what the return value was for this function. Uh, not too important. Uh, the next thing is it gets pushed onto the stack. And this actually happens at the beginning of the execution of the, uh, the authorized function. We'll see this happening. Is that the actual call function sets up the return address, but the authorized function code is um, pushing this old frame pointer, the, the main function's frame pointer, onto the stack as well. That way we can restore that when the authorized function is done executing. And our main can continue to reference its local variables, even though it's not doing so. And uh, the next thing that ends up on the stack is you'll see that like sub ESP 64 bytes, and that's to make room for authorizes uh, 64 byte buffer there for 64 bytes of local variables. So whenever we see this function call, the new things that are getting added onto the stack are save return address, save frame pointer, local variables. Okay, we'll see that in the Hey, Corey, there was a question from uh, Debbie about uh, is she supposed to be opening something specific? She has it running. No, not at this point. Just uh, as long as she can log in with the student and student uh, credentials. I just had a question. Sure. The, this stack that you're showing, doesn't that first entry the return item as a domain is only after authorizes call? Uh, the return address in the main actually happens as a result of the uh, the call function. So that really kind of happens in the main function. And if you look at main, which we will do, you'll see something like call authorized. And when that x86 call instruction happens, it's really pushing that return address onto the stack automatically. The other stuff is getting set up by the actual authorized function code. And this may be different on different architectures, but on x86 and like x64, this is how it works. Okay, so um, we've seen enough of all this abstractly. Let's see it in the real deal. So, hopefully, at this point, we all have our virtual machines going. And what I want you to do is um, compile the simple login program, but I want you to use TCC, not GCC. Because uh, TCC is a tiny C compiler, and it doesn't do any crazy optimizations like GCC does, and that just makes the assembly code a little bit more predictable. Whereas if we compile something with like you know a standard compiler like GCC, it's going to try to optimize our code, and it's going to make our stack look a little bit unexpected. So to compile it, uh, and everyone should be writing this kind of stuff down on a little sheet of paper, unless you're pretty comfortable with this. Um, it's like GCC, except you should fill in this G flag, because um, if you don't, GDB will basically bark on the executable and what it is. So TCC tiny C compiler dash G dash O simple login whatever you want to call you know call the output of the executable and simple login dot C. And so remote guys um, Try to keep you know this good paper with commands that you're using, and that's one you're going to want to write down is that TCC command. That way you can just uh, have that at your disposal for later, and you don't have to go flipping back to the slides. But like I said before, all these commands will be on the slides, so you can just kind of flip through and find them. So just remember TCC, not GCC for now, because if you use GCC, you'll get uh, wildly lost when you're stuck in one find like one. Okay, now to um, before we even start debugging it, let's just run the program a couple times to get a feel for you know what the program is supposed to do and how it works. And that just gives you a better idea of when you're actually debugging the application, you know, what you're actually seeing in the debugger. So if you just do dot slash simple login to run it, you know, it's gonna ask you for a password. And if um, you know you enter in the wrong password, it's going to tell you that it's not the right password. If you enter in the right password, it's gonna spawn a shell for you give you that nice classic message. So that's basically all the program does. And uh, that will just help you identify what you're looking at in the debugger. 
Is everyone remotely able to get the program compiled? Because you guys scolded me for now. <laughs> We're trying to make this look good for the, the webcast. So. It is the first time I've done this, so I'm trying to make lots of mistakes. So let's go ahead and uh, fire it up in the debugger. GDB, uh, simple login. And just to make sure everything's working good, you can type, uh, so that I'm going to write down disassist, which is short for disassemble. Main, which is the function you want to disassemble, just that main function. Hit enter, you know, you'll sort of see the code. And hopefully, uh, since all of you guys at least know ARM pretty well, knowing what the C source code does and looking at assembly should sort of make sense. This is this. So, oh. There might be some sh shorter mnemonics to some of these commands. Uh, if any of the GDB guys know them, feel free to tell me. And so, looking at this and knowing what the C source code does, um, it shouldn't be too surprising, right? So, we call the authorized function. It is going to ask for some input. Uh, the test function is checking the return value. If it's one thing, you know, spawn the shell together, print, you know, you're wrong, something like that. So what we're going to do is actually step to this function and see what happens to the stack. So here's another command for you guys to write down, you non-GDB guys. Break asterisk main plus what we want to do is break on that uh, call to the authorized function just so we can sort of see what's getting put onto the stack and see the stack in real time. And the asterisk is important, otherwise it won't work. Oops, don't type this assistant from that. So just like that. There's another one for you guys to be keeping for your notes. Does GDB have a way? I'm oh, sorry, I don't know. No pressure, we're not thinking about it. Could, to, to explicitly tell it authorized instead of because it seems to know the names of the uh, yes files. yeah yeah you can tell it authorized but I want you to actually break before authorized okay. okay so break asterisk uh, name plus nine and then uh, I've got to get my windy bug GDB get easier uh, type R to uh, go ahead and start the program and then the program will run we'll hit that breakpoint. And it's just that since we compiled the debugging symbols telling us where we are in the program, but we know that we're basically right, right before that call function is about to get executed. So if at this point you were to do um, x, just look at the stack sum with this command. Um, here's another one for you guys to write down x slash 10x dollar sign ESP. This is telling us x for examine. Uh, the slash parameter examine 10. U is hexadecimal. That's what the x is for. So examine 10 is hexadecimal. Um, dollar sign ESP starting with ESP register. And this just gives us an idea of sort of what's on our stack for that call function gets executed. So that's examining the contents of ESP. It's uh, examining the contents of where ESP is pointing at. So at this point, ESP is equal to OXPF FF uh, at 5A8, and then at that location in memory is these values. Yeah, so instances like that where I swear about have forgotten that that's not that intuitive, we've asked questions like that. So on the left, uh, before the call, there's kind of the address of the memory you're looking at, and on the right is the contents of the memory. Okay. So these are just things that are on the stack. Uh, another thing to take note of is what these stack addresses look like. One thing that's very useful in exploit development is to have a feel for what addresses are just on how they look. So for instance, um, whatever you see like OXPF FF608, um, you know that that's like a stack address because that's just that range of memory. And um, what is that OX8080? 08048034 address. You want to know what that is? So that's just a code address. So that's somewhere you know in our text segment. 
in our code. And you'll sort of um, pick up what all these are, like B7, E9, or B7 FE. Those are like uh, the one exploited modules, like libc. Those are like libc addresses. And you'll just get a feel for what these are as we go through the course. But it's kind of helpful to know when you're looking at the stack, trying to debug something. Oh, uh, that address is that, or, or whatever. Or that's a bogus address. Like if you see OX dead B, you know that's obviously bogus. The, uh, the, there's three entries, the A8, the B8, and the C8. Mm -hmm. Are those just the, those are all part of the, the ESP? Or are they um, the next? Yeah, those are just it, looking at um, 10, let's see, 10, so is that, uh, so yeah, 10 32 bit values. So those are 10 32 bit values starting at the address of where ESP points. So in this case, um, each line has four, and so since the width is four, and then there's four, four, and then two, so the three just comes from, you know, that's how many they can fit on the screen. Okay, and that's the, the reason it's showing 10 is because of that command. Pass. Yes. Okay. Examine slash, examine 10, x for hexadecimal. You could do x slash 10s for try to do the strings. Or x slash 10i to try to do his x86 instructions, which we'll use that. And then, you know, the register that we want to view from. Or you could just type the memory address in there. So you'll be using that command a lot. So make sure you have that one written down. Okay, so at this point, with the breakpoint, the call function has not actually executed. Um, what I want you to do is set a breakpoint for the beginning of the authorized function. Break asterisk authorized plus zero, and it's just going to um, break us right as authorized is called. We could just single step into it, but just to make things explicit, we're going to type all the symbol name. So, we know that the authorized function is about to be called. Because we've broken uh, the call authorized. And so, when we run again, hit R to run, or C to continue, I mean, sorry. It will have uh, hit the, basically the next instruction is like a basically a single step into, into that function. And we can see what happened to the, uh, the stack. So this looks a lot like what we just previously saw, but there should be one new value. And if you'll notice, that first value looks a little bit different. It's a 0804836B, right, just from your memory. That first address that you saw when you previously executed that command was OXBFFF608. And um, to sort of sanity check these addresses, we can inspect each address individually. So what is that first address that we see, 08048360, what is that address? What is it supposed to be? Where it returns? Yeah, the return address, right? Well, it's just pushed onto the stack was the return address because we just executed the call function. And if we want to verify that, we can do x slash, I'm just picking arbitrary numbers, um, And we can see that does, in fact, point back into main. And it points at the beginning of that code that handles the Intel scene. So no surprise there. Um, just sort of sanity checking the data that we're seeing. Is everyone with me so far to kind of understand uh, what we're Can I ask a order? question? I think I missed that last command that you had. It was the break asterisk oh. authorize plus zero? OK. I just want to be sure I had it right. Yeah. Yep, and then if you just hit C again, uh, after you set the breakpoint, it should execute until you get to that breakpoint. Okay, so let's type disassist authorize and just see what uh, the next group of instructions are about to be executed. So at this point, 
the call function has been executed, but none of authorizes instructions have been executed, right? Because of where we are in the process of execution. And you should see basically what I explained to you on the board. Uh, the first things that happen is you have to push the frame pointer. That way we can save main's frame pointer. That way main can continue to um, you know, reference its local variables once we return from this function. If everyone used the same uh, frame pointer, they would all just cloud rate to the local variables. So it's important that each one is unique. Um, uh, move EDP ESP is basically just um, starting our stack frame below the previous stack frame. That way, giving us all the fresh space on the stack. Sub ESP OX40. Who knows what OX40 is in decimal? Yeah, right. Because uh, our buffer, our local variables, is basically a 64 byte buffer, right? That's where the sub ESP40 is coming from. And then uh, that's basically those first three instructions. You're always going to see those because that's what's setting up the, uh, the local stack frame. And then the rest of the instructions starting at authorized plus nine is the actual instructions to execute the, um, the functions code. OK. So what I want you guys to do now is um, we're going to set a breakpoint for right after that stack frame is set up. That way we can look at a stack again and just see what's on there. <coughs> So actually, set the breakpoint for authorized plus three because I don't want that subtraction to happen yet uh, because it'll put us far away from other stuff on the stack. So do break asterisk authorized plus three and then C and then you can do like x slash ten x ESP again so check out that stack again. And um, what's this latest value on the stack? Any of our remote users have an answer to that one? OXBFFFF5A8. What is that value? All right, good takers, it looks like. Anyone in here? Our new stack frame pointer? That's the saved stack frame pointer. The new stack frame pointer is actually in the register, right? The actual contents of the EDP register. What you see there is what the contents of the EDP register was during when the main function was executing. And we're just saving that so we can restore it. For the Here's another pretty handy command for you guys to know. I use this one at Paramount and uh, exploit development. It's x slash 2x. And before I actually even execute this command, uh, who can tell me what this will display for us? Just two values. What will those two values be? So if you execute the previous stack frame and the save return address. So when you're developing your exploits and you want to see what you've done to the return address at this point, um, use this command, x slash 2x or examine 2, this hexadecimal, EVT. That'll tell you what is a saved frame pointer and what is the return address. That way you can see if you're corrupting those values or um, you know, messing them up in some way or if they're not what you expect them to be. So that's a good one to write down and have memorized. But generally speaking, those are, should always be the same while you're in a particular function when everything's going the way it's supposed to be. Yes, generally speaking. Sometimes you'll see crazy things happen. Um, sometimes programs actually modify their own frame pointer or save frame pointer or turn address to do crazy things. Uh, but generally speaking, you should not Quick see question. that. Quick question. Um, the uh, sure. so on that x two x command is, is this essentially what you're saying is you're starting at the EBP and reading up reading up yes. two thirty two bit words up the stack precisely okay precisely 
and stored and where EDP is pointing is a saved frame pointer. And then right after the saved frame pointer is a saved return address. And that's why you see that. And that's above on that's a that's going up the mem memory address. Uh, going up. Okay. Going up exactly. The X command will go up in memory. So if you do X ten, it will look at the ten address and the twenty address and the thirty address. If you, you know, told it to examine like forty bytes or something like that. And that's the opposite direction of what the stack, stack is doing. Yeah. Pretty. Good. Yeah, that's a little bit tricky. So. Um, so we'll Examine. So it's looking at increasingly higher memory addresses when you use the X command. Okay. Okay. But um, remember that the stack is going down. Of course, right. So if you use the X command halfway up your stack or halfway down your stack, you're going to be missing half of it. You know, you'll be looking at all this stuff. Yes. And some of your stuff is down here. Good. Yep. So that's something to keep in mind. And when we get to the E, things in the E grow upwards. Right. So that'll be another fun twist to put on things. Okay, so uh, at this point we've stopped at authorized plus three, which means authorized plus three has not executed, so we haven't created space for that local variable. And that's just uh, creating space for that 64 byte buffer we have in the authorized function. Um, not too interesting. I just wanted to show you guys uh, how that actually is used. So what I'm going to have you guys do is set a breakpoint for after the call to gets, which is reading our, our user input, our password attempt, and then we can look at the stack again and see what's on there. So I want you guys to set a breakpoint for authorized plus 32. And the way I'm getting it, or yeah, authorized plus 32, that's correct, after the gets call. Okay? And um, So break asterisk authorized plus 32, C for continue, and enter in your password attempt, you know, password or something like that, to enter. And now I want you to look at the stack again, okay, so remember that command? It says we want x slash 10 x. Does everyone see some crazy values in there? 0x73736170, something like that, or it might be different depending on what your password attempt was. Um, and that is basically just, you know, the ASCII codes for the characters you entered in. All right. Uh, the first address you see there, which is a little bit crazy, is uh, actually just a remnant of the call to GITS, which hasn't been cleaned up on the stack yet. So if you were to do authorized plus 35, and basically I'm just bumping us past that. You see that add ESP4? That's just um, cleaning up some stuff, the arguments that were passed to the, uh, the GITS call. And see again, that way our stack is a uh, should be a little bit more sanitized at this point. And uh, it's a little bit hard to interpret this if you haven't, you know, looked at a lot of hexadecimal before. Like I can instantly recognize, okay, it's like an ASCII string, like a capital, like a PAS or something like that. Um, but you can use the x slash s command, which is another handy one. For I try to interpret this memory address as a string. And we can see that, hey, look, after the call to gets, this password string is on the stack. And that's just because that password buffer was on the stack. And the uh, password buffer has already been um, filled up by our password attempt. Okay. At this point, I want you guys to do this one. 
x slash 50 x dsp. So at this point, Bill, I'm going to draw something on the board again. Now this is for my stack. It might look a little bit different depending on what you entered in as your password. Dollar signs. Or yeah, that, yeah, that should be a dollar sign. Okay. Um, so this is my stack. Alright, this is my stack in the program program's execution at this point. The ESP register is pointing right here. This is the bottom of my stack. This is the outer limits going no further. This point. Right here is a uh, the P character A S S W Anyone know what this character would be? No term. Does a ASCII string is always null terminated? Where are you usually null terminated in fashion? Say that always. Um, What's the next one? What, what, what would the next value on the stack be? Save EDP. Or there's more space in here because we have 64 bytes of space, so blah, 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 blah. Later on, that a little bit better. Blah, 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 blah. And then right at this point, we'll say is. ESP plus 64 and then saved DP and then return address. This is what my stack looks like. ESP plus 0, ESP plus 1, plus D plus 3, blah 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 blah, plus 64. And then um, plus 68. But the dump from the x slash 50x would start from the bottom. Yes. So <coughs> what I want you to do at this point is um, and chain of command will done, you guys. And I'm putting the B in, which is look at byte values instead of 32-bit um, values, so you know 8-bit eight, eight values, just so this kind of matches up with uh, what I'm showing you on the board a little bit better. So x slash 70, examine 70 bytes and do them in hexadecimal starting at the stack pointer. These values aren't null. You see just a lot of other junk values here after our string. That's because the stack is just kind of lazily deleted. You know, so we're actually deleted. Uh, old contents from the stack are still on there. We'll talk about how that can be a problem later on. And then later on down the line, you'll see like the uh, so let's identify them. Let's see what they actually are. Slash two x. Do a higher return address. My save frame pointer on. Oops.
So yeah, we can see the uh, beginnings of those on the right here. This is the same print pointer. And if I go a little bit further, um, that's the beginnings of the uh, return address. Yeah, right, because the for me. So the, the B and W change the mode? Yes. W just switching back to the B mode. Okay, so at this point, uh, remote users too, does everyone have a general understanding of what is on the con what is on the stack at this point in the program's execution, where those values came from? And feel generally okay with where we're at in the material at this point? Is any of this wildly confusing to people? Good remote guys, do it okay? So if you have any specific questions or would like me to um, go over any of those topics, um, please, please let me know. Okay, lots of uh, sort of, I know the material is a little bit I have confusing. a quick question. Um, so sure, sure. every one of those, um, like when you drew password going up the stack, every one of those, every one of those characters yes. is, is represented by 8 bits, right? So it is I'm sorry. Isn't this is the stack not done by 32-bit words? It is, but you can um, but you can just interpret it as single byte values as well. Okay. It's all it's all matter how you interpret it. But yeah, <coughs> I mean generally you're pushing four byte things on or off the stack. So is it is it storing the P and then three blank bytes? Or no, like you can see, if you do um, I mean, it's, uh, if you look at them as thirty-two bit values, it appears as this seven three seven three six one seven zero, um, and a seven zero is actually the P, and the six one is the A, and the seven three and the seven three are S's. That's just backwards because we'll little Indian or big Indian. I'll talk sure. about that in a second. But you know, it's just um, it's just memory, and you can interpret it in any okay. granularity that you want to. So in terms of ASCII strings, the compiler just knows to interpret it into eight bit granularity because it knows it's done with uh, eight bit values. So. so when you do it in uh, thirty two bit words, it'll put it in little Indian word, but if you do byte at a time, it'll yes, work. exactly. Yeah, and it's only putting in little Indian mode because it's saying I'm in a, I'm on x86. So since he's asking for a 32-bit value, I'm going to automatically switch it to order since I slid one way. Talk more about that in a second. So don't worry if he doesn't uh, get that little Indian or big Indian stuff. But just remember, this is all just you know memory, like a big vector, and you can put whatever you want to there, and then how you interpret it, either as 32-bit values or 8-bit values. Is completely up to you and the compiler. You can also put it into character mode so they get a little more user friendly. Yeah, that's 10C, right? Yeah. Yeah, it just um, it helps to be able to recognize that everything looks like it's hexadecimal when you're developing exploits, which is why I'm kind of having you guys do that. <laughs> 